so we're just gonna stand here nice and quiet, and you are gonna get in the back of the squad car, and we'll all be happy. Well, I won't be happy. We're waiting. Tap, tap, tap. Okay, so this is a video I wasn't expecting to ever make, but boy am I happy that I get to. Back in 2018, I did a review of Stubbs the Zombie in Rebel Without a Pulse, a 2005 original Xbox title from developer Wideload Games. It touted itself as having been made with the Halo engine, and was even helmed by the executive producer of the original Halo. I'm still fairly proud of the original video I did back in 2018, but considering that I was still relatively new to video writing at the time, especially for a game review that long, I feel like I could do a better job of it if I were to do it today. It was even kind of a proto-franchise graveyard episode. It kind of had a hand in formulating the general structure of that show. I ended that original video by saying, I do say that Stubbs the Zombie is a game that you should approach with caution. Because around the time of that video, the game was never ported or re-released, so it was trapped on hardware that, by that point in time, was so old you couldn't even call it last gen. And as a result, Xbox copies were borderline impossible to find, and were going for ridiculous prices online. But then, in March of 2021, something I never would have expected happened. The game was suddenly, completely out of nowhere, finally getting a re-release for modern systems. I know I was certainly caught by surprise when I saw it get announced in the March 2021 Nintendo Direct. Lord knows I could barely contain my excitement on Twitter. Not only that, but now the game was going multi-platform, so now more people than ever before are able to check out this little hidden gem for the first time, in case they missed it before. Which brings me to now, now that the re-release has been out for a while. Almost a whole year at this point. Oh, wow. It took me almost a whole year to get around to revisiting this. It probably would have made more sense to do this video when it just came out. Oh god, no wonder I don't have more subscribers. There, there, anyway, which brings me to now. This game just has such an interesting concept. There aren't too many games out there, let alone story-driven third-person action games, where the zombie is the protagonist rather than bullet fodder for the main hero. So that concept by itself was enough to get me interested when the game was first announced all those years ago. This and the first Psychonauts were the two big Xbox exclusives I was most looking forward to in 2005. For this video, I'll be playing the PC version with an Xbox One controller, but the game is available on, well, pretty much everything. So let's not waste any more time, let's go ahead and boot it up. Ah oh, man, what is this? They changed the title screen music. In the original Xbox version, you would hear small samples of the game's licensed soundtrack, which consisted of songs from the 1950s, covered by then-modern bands on the title screen. Now it's just replaced with the instrumental that plays when you drive the vehicle on that third level. I mean, it's not like Aspire doesn't have the rights to those songs anymore. They still play during the dance-off section in that one level. I mean, I mean, they're even selling the soundtrack as DLC, so... What's going on here? But I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. I should start by getting into how the game begins. The year is 1959, and the self-proclaimed city of the future known as Punchbowl, Pennsylvania, a city of talking robots, hover cars, and barbershop quartets, is having its opening ceremony hosted by its founder, multi-billionaire industrialist Andrew Munday. Everything seems to be going swimmingly in this retro-futuristic city, when suddenly, a zombie randomly rises from the ground. And with that, say hello to our protagonist, Edward Stubblefield, or Stubbs for short. In life, Stubbs was a down-on-his-luck traveling salesman during the Great Depression era of the 1930s, and was met with a gruesome fate one day when a potential customer unloaded a shotgun right into his guts and buried him in a shallow grave in the Pennsylvania countryside. 
As it just so happens, this remote Pennsylvania countryside would eventually become the building site of Punch Bowl in the 26 years that followed, and this is where our story kicks off. And it's with here you immediately get acquainted with the game's central gimmick, converting your enemies into zombies by eating their brains. This was the game's biggest selling point back in the day. That and the fact that the game runs on the same engine as Halo. Seriously, it becomes super apparent as soon as you get into a vehicle. You ever drive a Warthog before in Halo? Of course you have. Well, controlling a vehicle in Stubbs the Zombie feels exactly the same. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. It isn't long before you're let loose in a slightly more open area to chomp down on some more gray matter and convert the citizens of Punchbowl into your zombie minions. This first bigger area allows you to get acquainted with the concept of converting your enemies into zombies and having them fight other enemies for you. They can even convert enemies into zombies themselves, giving you a huge horde of zombies to do your bidding. Despite this particular area being a bit bigger than the last, there's only the one exit. Stubbs the Zombie has linear level progression, not unlike the one also found in Halo, meaning that the general gameplay loop consists exclusively of fulfilling some kind of task in a level, and then exiting onward to the next. And it's with the ending of the game's second level that we're given our main overall goal. Stubbs discovers Maggie Monday, the mother of Andrew Monday, and develops some not-so-dead wood for her and begins his trek to track her down. Along the way, you'll have a few abilities to help you out, alongside being able to zombify your enemies. The first one you're given is the ability to stun surrounding enemies by... Ow! Yeah, I should mention, this game has some rather crass humor. I'm not sure I have enough cash to cover- Oh, never you mind, sir. It's on the house. Oh, it's my pleasure, officers. My pleasure. You'll also be able to throw your guts like grenades, throw your head like a bowling ball and detonate it, and take your hand off and latch it onto enemies' heads to control them. More on that later. These abilities can be recharged after use by feeding on brains, and you can replenish your gut grenades to hold up to three of them at a time. How much of a charge you get depends on the type of enemy you're feeding on, as you might expect. Speaking of enemies, the ones you'll encounter vary depending on the level you're in. In the city, you'll find regular unarmed civilians, which are the easiest to feast upon, as well as cops who take a little more force to weaken to a state where feeding on them is made possible. Admittedly, the standard combat isn't very deep. In fact, it's actually a little clunky. You basically just mash the X button and trade blows with your opponent until they're dead or weakened enough to eat their brains. Though you can also zombify your enemies by just killing them with standard melee attacks. Though if your new zombie friends are killed by non-zombified enemies, they don't respawn again, they're dead permanently. And while most levels tend to have a finite number of enemies that can be zombified, some key areas such as boss fights do have respawning enemies that can be zombified. Feeding on them not only recharges your special abilities, but also a little chunk of your health as well. The game does contain a regenerating health system, but you can get a little health back in a pinch by feasting on brains. I'll go a little more detail on how the zombie horde mechanics work a little later. Whenever you possess an enemy with a gun, you also gain access to that weapon for yourself, and it kind of plays a little bit like a third-person shooter. You have infinite ammo while possessing an enemy with a gun, but I find the gunplay, while fun in its own right, to be a bit rough around the edges. Not only do you move pretty slowly, but unless your gun has a scope, you're not allowed to aim down sights or zoom in your view to get a better shot, like in shooters today, so you're kind of at the mercy of the game's reticle. Enemies killed while possessing another enemy also don't come back as zombies, so it's kind of up to you whether or not you want to go this route in certain areas. As the game goes on, more enemy types are gradually introduced, including one of my personal favorite enemy types, the white trash militia types. It's like someone took anti-vaxxers and put them into a video game. Not only is this farm chapter one of my favorite locations in the game, but I'm always a sucker for humor that makes fun of hillbillies. Oh, oh, oh. I got a blade in my head. <laughs> in fact, this game is one of the funniest I've ever played, even 16 years later. Not only does it have humorous visual gags, but characters will tend to say funny things during gameplay. 
It's worth it just to hide and listen to what enemies have to say before you engage them. I mentioned vehicles earlier, and these are a blast to drive. One of my favorites is the Sawtomobile. Yes, that's really what it's called. It's a hovering cart with a cannon that fires balls of dirt at enemies, and it's incredibly satisfying to fire this thing at a cluster of enemies and send them flying. When you reach the farm area, you get to drive a tractor that's outfitted with sharp objects in the front. Ramming into enemies with it will cause them to get impaled and stick to it for a few moments. It's a gruesome detail, and I love it. The whole farm chapter is my favorite in the whole game. It definitely plays up the horror comedy aspect of the game the best, in my opinion. You can also drive a jeep and eventually a tank, and again, if you've ever played a Halo game before, you'll know exactly how they control. Earlier, I mentioned that one of the main gimmicks of the game is the ability to have a horde of zombified enemies follow you as your companions. This is helpful for distracting enemies while you get the drop on them, or allowing you to focus on another objective. If commanding a large horde of the undead sounds daunting, you can wrangle them together to follow you by facing in their direction and pressing up on the D-pad. The original version originally had this map to the Y button, but because you can also shove your zombies away with this button, it was remapped to a D-pad button. So it's handy that you don't have to wait for the right prompt to show up on screen before you can do it now. In fact, the re-release makes a few quality of life changes over the original version. For starters, originally, you'd shamble fairly slowly for about 5 seconds before you pick up speed, even if you were holding the left stick all the way forward. This could get a bit annoying if you were in a hurry or were in a tough spot with enemies, but now, as soon as you lean forward on the left stick, you immediately start sprinting at full speed. This is a change I didn't know I wanted. Also, the original game had screen filters, such as film grain and a green tint that the game calls Zombie Vision. These were... okay, I guess, but the re-release allows you to turn these filters off completely. And in all honesty, I'm super glad they're optional this time around. Not having any of them on just makes the game way easier to see, and it honestly just makes the game look better in my opinion. So the footage you're going to be seeing is me having them turned off. The game also gives you a much wider field of vision compared to the original as well, and it runs at a consistent 60 frames per second as opposed to the original version's 30. These funny little loading screens from the Xbox version are completely gone in the re-release. As you might expect, the game just loads up so much quicker now. Originally it would take up to 45 seconds for a level to load, but now, nowhere near as long. And while I do kind of miss these funny little illustrations, I'll take faster loading times any day. Though, if you're going into this expecting it to look like a brand new AAA release, then you're going to be very disappointed. These are the same visuals, the same textures, and the same stiff facial animations that were in the 2005 original, just sharpened and scaled up for HD. Though, that may not necessarily be a bad thing. Personally, I found this to be one of the better looking original Xbox games for its time. The graphics were quite good for an OG Xbox title in 2005, but I can see some people being disappointed that this isn't a remake on the same level as, say, the Crash Insane trilogy or the Destroy All Humans remake. So you may need to set your expectations accordingly here if you're going into this completely blind. If anything, this is more in line of a straight-up port than a remaster. While this re-release definitely has little improvements here and there, some of the original game's shortcomings do still crop up. Like I've stated earlier, the melee combat is incredibly bare and honestly as basic as you can get. And you have to do quite a bit of it too. So it can get a bit... well, brainless. Uh, I wonder how many other reviews on YouTube have made that joke already. There's also this real bitch of a minigame at the very end of the police station chapter. After going through the whole chapter being taunted by Police Chief Masters... Get it? Chief Masters? Master Chief? You finally find the bastard, and instead of fighting him like a standard boss fight... I told you I would dance in your grave, and I met it! He challenges you to a dance-off. And as funny and as out of left field as this moment is, 
The actual gameplay is honestly kind of a pain in the ass. It's literally just Simon, if you've ever played that. But I swear, and maybe it's just me, but the inputs seem like they're delayed by about maybe a quarter of a second. It caused me to miss a bunch of inputs and therefore fail my turn. Now granted, there are checkpoints in this minigame, so if you outright fail your turn too many times and lose the challenge, you just restart at the beginning of the round you were on, and you don't have to do the whole dance off from the beginning all over again. I think I just don't have a good enough memory or good enough rhythm. But luckily, it is pretty short, and it's the only one that appears in the whole game. Another thing that feels like a complete oversight on the part of the re-release is that since all of the cutscenes run in real time, you'd think they'd have the ability to run it full screen. Or is it widescreen? I understand letterboxing the top and bottom of the screen for a thematic effect, but we also see black bars on both the sides as well. And to my knowledge, the cutscenes aren't pre-rendered, so I don't know why they couldn't have had them run in full screen. Or widescreen, whatever. This is what it looks like in-game without my little background image. You're basically watching the cutscenes in a little square behind an empty black void. For as cool as the zombie herd mechanic is, they can sometimes be a bit brain dead, pardon the pun. It seemed like whenever I had a particularly huge group of them, they wouldn't follow me when I whistled to them. I did what the game told me to do and faced them and called on them, but a lot of them just wouldn't listen. I also had a problem at one point of some of them getting stuck inside of a doorway and not following me either. The game does have a couple of clever sections of needing a group of zombies to bust down a wall or a door, but there's only about two of these in the whole game. I feel like if the game had just one more of these sections, or heck, opened the game world up just a little bit more and gave us extra buildings to raid for goodies or more people to zombify, it would have better given off the feel of commanding a zombie army. But what we have here is a very linear point A to point B structure. As you might expect, the game gets a lot tougher as it goes on, the last quarter of the game being the hardest. I think the area that's going to give players the toughest time, aside from the final boss fight, is this area right before the final level. You have to destroy a tank before the door to the exit opens. To do that, you need to blow it up with gut grenades, and to recharge them, you need to feast on lower level civilians that will occasionally pop out, but while you're doing this, there's a chance the tank will be aiming right at you, so if you're in the cannon's sight for too long, it'll blast you to kingdom come before you can do anything. This section can get a bit frustrating, and I think I honestly may have had to try it more times in the game's final boss. I mean, it's par for the course that the game gets harder around this point, but it isn't made clear to you that this particular door only opens after you blow up the tank, so I think that's where half the difficulty in this section comes from. Though that's not to say that the final boss is a pushover, as not only do you have them blasting at you, you also have to deal with other enemies with guns blasting at you, while trying to destroy the final boss's shields. It's probably worth mentioning that I played this on the normal difficulty, and I still kind of had a rough time of it. And while these particular sections in the game can get pretty annoying, none of this is what I would really consider major deal breakers. That's just your typical last stretch of the game being the hardest part mechanic coming into play. I'm honestly just being what's called nitpicky. Though, it may be worth mentioning that perhaps because of how linear the game is, it won't take you any longer than maybe 5 or 6 hours to complete it. There isn't really anything in the way of extra modes, but there is two-player co-op if you want to tackle the game with a friend. This playthrough, mostly knowing what to do ahead of time, took me just under 6 hours to get to the end. It's not a super long game, and the gameplay loop is more or less consistent throughout. Now, back when this game still cost $50, or god, when physical copies were going for insane prices online, it was enough for me to say to approach this game with caution, but now that the game is only $20 and is readily available on all platforms, I can now easily tell you with no hesitation to give it a try. Just be sure to know going into it that this is still a port of a middle market game from 2005 and not a AAA remake with the most cutting edge graphics. But if you're anything like me, you're bound to get quite a bit out of this game. Well, 
Now that we're near the end of the video, I guess I should talk a little bit about what ended up happening to Wide Load Games. In 2008, they released Hail to the Chimp, a party game for the PS3 and Xbox 360 to mixed reception. In 2009, Wide Load was purchased by none other than the Walt Disney Corporation, and then a year after that released Guilty Party for the Nintendo Wii, which was also a party game. Then Disney Interactive went under restructuring, and Wide Load was tasked with exclusively making... mobile games. Great. Strangely enough, though, one of the games that Wide Load was tasked with making was actually a Kingdom Hearts game for mobile before the Kingdom Hearts game for mobile. Probably no big surprise, but this didn't make it that far into development before it was canned. And then finally in 2014, the Disney overlords shut down Wide Load and more or less euthanized their whole gaming division. And while that may have been the end of Wide Load, it may not necessarily be the end of Stubbs. The game's publisher, Aspire, still exists, and this re-release more than likely wouldn't have been possible without them. And because they still own the rights to the game, it stands to reason that if this re-release sells well enough, they could commission another developer to make a sequel. A sequel was planned at one point before the Disney buyout, so it's not entirely out of the question. Hell, many core members of Wide Load would go on to open a new company called Ragtag Studios, and just as recently as 2020, they launched their first game, Raise the Dead. I haven't had a chance to play it yet, but it looks pretty fun, what little I've seen of it anyway. But yeah, if we want an honest-to-god sequel to Stubbs the Zombie, the only way we can convince Aspire to fun one is for this re-release to sell well. The jury's out if I did a good enough job convincing you to pick it up for yourself, but at only 20 bucks, what have you got to lose? And if for whatever reason $20 is still too rich for your blood, this game tends to go on sale for half off pretty frequently, I've noticed. It's an enjoyable little forgotten gem from the Xbox's past. It's got a few small issues, but nothing that I find really hold it back from being worth picking up. But what about you? Have you had a chance to play this game for yourself yet? If you have, please let me know in the comments section, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. And uh, while you're down there, why don't you go ahead and give this video a rate, and maybe subscribe if you haven't already. Just a suggestion. Also, I think it's funny how the promotional material for the re-release removed Stubbs' cigarette. I just thought that was funny.